Most people will agree command of evidence quantitative questions on the reading and writing exam are one of the hardest question types, if not perhaps the hardest question type on the exam. We've been through sort of our introductory how to solve or hack for this type of question. And that advice was to check every answer for accuracy and relevancy, which when you first learn of that, for a lot of students, that's an eye opener. Aha, I know what to do to how to solve these. But that has a couple shortcomings. One, if the scenario, which sometimes it is, in the tables and the names and the what's going on becomes very complicated, you don't understand it. It's hard to decide what am I looking for to be relevant to. Or I don't have to always check every answer for the accuracy and the relevancy each time. There's a different approach, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Hack number two for how to solve digital SAT command of evidence quantitative questions. Now, this approach takes a little different framework of mind and thought. It's very consistent with the approach of accuracy and relevancy, but it's a different way of thinking. Much like, I will say, teaching students for the first time about independent clauses and dependent clauses and looking at sentences and paragraphs that way is very different than what they're used to doing, which is reading for comprehension what the story is about. So how the things are punctuated and the clauses are put together is a different skill set entirely. But once they sort of master that new frame of thought, they tend to ace grammar and race through the questions, which tend to be very quick for students who know how to do it. This is a little like that. It's going to be a different frame of thought. So let's get into it. What exactly do I mean? When we see a command of evidence quantitative question, you first probably want to read the question, then you want to read the paragraph, and then you want to check the table, the chart, the graphic, and try and relate the important information from that graphic to the text itself. Okay, so that's a big, broad statement. Very important but broad statement. Today, we're going to dig deeper into that, show you exactly how to do that. And the result will be, I think you'll be more confident in answering these questions. You'll be faster and you'll be able to handle harder questions you might not otherwise even get. And we'll show some examples of that in this video. In order to get started, we have to start thinking about the world of infographics, tables, and charts as a series of columns and rows not just scenarios and ideas but just structurally columns and rows and charts as legend items y-axis data and x-axis data fundamentally they all boil down to just that and every question or every paragraph ends with a conclusion a claim a hypothesis that needs to be supported or weakened that develops a relationship between the legend items, the x-axis, perhaps a particular column or a comparison between two columns over the rows or a single row as it compares to two different columns. In fact, there are many different variations of row, column, legend, x-axis, y-axis combinations. The conclusion or the claim could request your objective like a word problem trying to translate the words of text into mathematical or algebraic expressions and equations your goal is to transform that conclusion or claim at the end into an appropriate relationship between columns rows legends and axes it's a little bit different way of thinking let's start with a very simple example here the condition says the highest number of tools made from clamshells that were collected from the beach. So right there we want clamshells collected from the beach. We want this column was found at a depth of. So we want the highest number, which is this, 99. So the depth that occurs is this row. Here we want a specific row and a specific column the other columns and rows are irrelevant let's see another condition in this case the findings suggest that across the years analyzed so across all years 
there was a growing interest among CEOs in connecting with more departments. So department leaders, we want that legend item, and it must be growing across the x-axis, which means it must be going upward. I don't care about answers that relate one legend item to the other. The question condition is not asking me what the difference is between the legend items or a specific time or an absolute vertical X, Y axis level. It just simply wants to show a growing legend item across the X axis. In this case, we're looking for a divided Congress that's essentially maybe necessary but not sufficient. So that's a little tricky condition, but we know we're looking across specific rows versus other rows in our table for a decrease in government size. So a particular change in government size is represented by total outlays in this column. So we know from the definition of the claim, we're looking at differences among certain rows for this column, not the other columns, and we're looking for a particular change or decrease in certain cases. In this case, we're asserting countries in each region. That's all the rows. So across all the rows, we want the effects on provisioning services and that they represent the majority of the reported services. So provisioning services in one particular column, and we compare that to the other two columns for all the rows. That's exactly what we need to do here in terms of row column comparisons. In this way, you're kind of solving a word problem. You're taking the text, you're translating it to an equation or a specific relationship between legends and rows and columns and axes and which ones you need to compare or contrast or show changes over time. And it doesn't matter how complicated or weird they label their rows and columns and graphs and legends. It's essentially X's and Y's and which means this approach can be very helpful for getting right to the right answer, even in very difficult problems. Let's see a few of those. Let's look at the following problem. So the first part of the text basically tells us due to climate change, they're going to be fewer but more concentrated intense storms and rainfall. Okay, I understand that intuitively, but when we get down to the conclusion, it mentions Fewer events will result in a higher number of dry days. Well, wait a second. As I go up to the table, I look at the title, Simulated Change in Annual Aquifer Input and Irrigation, Baseline Concentration, Percentage Change in Water Entering Aquifers, Percentage Change in Surface Used in Irrigation, Groundwater for Irrigation. I don't see dry days. So <laughs> these tables are very confusing relative to what's being said in the conclusions or the conditions so far. So this could be a tricky problem. I won't pretend to understand what any of this really is and what it means. I just don't understand the scenario. So what do I do as a student as I'm looking at this on the test? Well, I'm gonna go back to our convert the word problem into an equation or a relationship of rows and columns scenario here to try and answer this. So I'll keep going with my condition or conclusion here. It triggers more irrigation. Okay, well, I know these columns represent irrigation, so it should be more. The whole graph is a simulated change, so it should be positive for more. So this data should be positive. But this change in irrigation output, which is what we just discussed, is highly sensitive to the baseline concentration of precipitation. I have no idea what that is, but I do know in the graph, this is the baseline concentration of precipitation. There are two row items that represent that, and it's sensitive, which means we wanna look at the difference between these rows. We wanna know the irrigation columns as they differ among the two rows. Well, what I see is it is sensitive, this row, increases very little, this row increases quite a bit. 
So I want the answer that represents the wording of this row changing a little bit and the wording of this row changing a lot by comparison, but they both increase. And then I can scan through the answers really quickly and figure out the baseline precipitation is somewhat concentrated. Water use for irrigation will increase only slightly. That's true, right? The first row increases 0.4 and 0.9%, whereas it will increase 9. Now they give me numbers 9 and 7.9% for groundwater baseline precipitation is evenly distributed again i have no idea what that means but this is evenly distributed and the groundwater increases plus nine and plus 7.9 percent so even though i don't even understand these labels i can quickly get to the right answer b must be correct here's another scenario which i might not even understand from head to toe not only is the chart difficult to read, up to 25, more than 25% home heating needs met with subsurface thermal pollution for two temperature conditions by percentage of sites, current surface temperature, maximum plausible surface temperature, and at least in the other one, we read through the paragraph, the idea was pretty simple. Here the paragraph is even more confusing. So what the heck do you do in this case? Well, again, let's go back to trying to assess what legends or axes come into play in the condition and try and put that together so we see the team concluded that if surface temperature approaches the maximum plausible level okay that's the dark column in our chart maximum surface temperature so if it approaches maximum level well i know percentage of sites i'm going to assume not 100 percent sure but where we have a very high percentage of maximum plausible surface temperature, this is where the temperature is approaching that. And the opposite would be down here, okay? The claim says in that case, the percentage of sites where thermal pollution could feasibly contribute to meeting home heating needs will increase. Well, yeah, if we're at the large dark bar, it's more than 25%, whereas in the opposite conditions at sort of the zero end no we're not at maximum plausible surface temperature or the dark bar whatever that represents it's very little it's no home heating needs met okay so i'm going to look for the answer choice that matches that that's the relationship of legends and x and y axes that i need to work through so under both temperature conditions, less than 10% of sites were in the up to 25% group with the maximum plausible. Okay, we don't care about both temperature conditions. That's going to be wrong. This is not telling me the low bar and 0% and the, bar, the dark bar must be high in the up to 25%. That's not right. And I'm not doing a comparison across dark bar to light bar. That's just not the comparison. Two, at current surface temperatures, more than 80% of the sites have no need for supplemental local home heating from subsurface pollution, whatever that is. But at the maximum possible surface temperature, more than 70% of sites exhibit significantly greater home heating needs. So what is this? This is actually saying at surface temperatures, more than 80% of the sites have no need. So this is, again, light bar versus more than 70% significantly greater home heating needs at maximum. So max, this basically says this is greater than 70. This is again, dark bar versus light bar. It is not a dark versus light. So again, tricky here, might be some question, but I don't see at most in the chart at all. D, at current surface temperatures, more than 80% of the sites cannot use subsurface thermal pollution to meet any proportion of local home heating needs. Okay, this is at current, so this is kind of cannot mean. So that's really the opposite. Rather than the dark bar, we've got a really high bar for the light bar, that's kind of the complementary case. 
but at the maximum plausible temperature, that percentage drops to below 20%. So that's saying the light bar at this case drops below 20%, which is actually the same thing as what we're looking for, that the dark bar goes from near zero up to near 100. The complement or the flip side of that very same situation is the light bar goes down. Notice how they flip that a lot of the time. So if they says I'm more often heads, I could also say I'm less often tails. It's the same answer logically. This is going to be the right relationship. So while I'm not 100% confident, I did use my sort of just straight identify the column, the legend, the axes relationships to my best efforts. And I'm able to get what I think is going to be, and in fact is, the right answer here. Okay, in one of the earlier examples, I highlighted in the correct answer where we were contrasting the differences between two rows, the word whereas, a contrasting transition, and pointed out that's important. Well, whenever we compare or contrast differences between, say, rows or legends or columns for that example, we're going to use words like whereas, while, but. Now, if you're working across all rows or all elements in the x-axis, you're going to see words like both kind of inclusive comparison keywords and transition words. That really helps when we're looking through the answer choice to figure out what should be the right answer, what is not the right answer based on the right connection of rows and columns, etc. that should be the case. So let's take a quick look at how that works in this example and helps us solve it really quickly. So for this example, our conclusion or our claim is by comparison the rel comparing the relative concentrations of nucleobases in meteorites. Well, basically that means we're looking at these two columns and relative to something else relative to those in the soil versus this. So I want the concentrations, which is the numerical values, which is what this chart is about, for these first two columns versus the third soil column. Now, and I want it across all nucleobases. So let's take a look. Here I see both meteorite samples, but not soil. Okay, that seems a possible correct connection for what we have to do. B, I see both meteorite and soil. No, both and cannot be correct. That's wrong. That's not the right condition. That's not a contrast between this series of columns we're working with. Both the Murchison meteorite and, again, both and cannot be correct. Here we have detected much sample one, but not two. So we don't even have a both here. We're actually contrasting the two meteorites, which we know is not the case. I want to look at both meteorite columns versus the soil column. So right away, that connection of buts and boths doesn't work. The answer must be A, both meteorite, but not soil sample. Notice I haven't even read the sort of informational part of the answer choices. I really don't even know what they say, but that is the right answer. And I got there strictly by looking at the transition word clues relative to what I thought they would be set up among the relationship of, in this case, between columns and across columns. So that could be a really useful technique to work quickly or corroborate what you think is the right answer.